Hello. We're going to talk about memory consolidation and memory updating today. This is a tremendously uh, important and vigorous area of contemporary research that has profound implications for clinical psychology and lots of other things. So this is really an exciting uh, area. Now, to get into it, uh, let me review the three stages of information processing that we've been talking about. In order to form a memory, you have to first learn or acquire the information. And then, of course, you have to retain that information. And uh, the transition from acquisition to retention uh, it involves consolidating the memory or somehow creating a, 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 a form of the memory that can last a long time in, in the nervous system. And there are several different forms of memory consolidation. Memory consolidation occurs at the uh, uh, cellular and molecular level, and that tends to happen fairly rapidly. But we also consolidate memories at the level of neural circuits, and that can take a couple of days. So it's this memory consolidation that then uh, transforms the information in a, into a, a, a form where it can be retained for a long period of time. And then, of course, if we want to use it, we have to retrieve the information. So uh, the next slide uh, shows you what's uh, referred to as the traditional view of uh, memory consolidation. So as I mentioned, we're talking about the original learning uh, and, uh, and that acquisition has to be consolidated to create a permanent or long-term memory. And then when you want to use the memory, uh, you undergo you, uh, a retrieval kind of process to uh, return the memory to, to an active state. And what's critical about this uh, sort of traditional conception of memory consolidation is that according to this view, uh, consolidation only occurs once. It occurs between original acquisition and under retention of that information. Once the information has be, been retained, then uh, it doesn't have to be consolidated again. That is, uh, you can make use of it or not, and it just stays there in that form. Now, that's in contrast to a lot of research coming out within just the last 10 years uh, in which uh, they talk about, uh, they've identified a, uh, a second form of re uh, uh, consolidation that's illustrated in the next slide. So the contemporary view starts out the same as the original, uh, traditional view. Original learning has to be consolidated. In, and that forms the permanent or long-term memory that I referred to here as 1.0. Now, when you remember that information, you retrieve that into an active state. And now, once a memory has been reactivated, it can become reconsolidated. And this reconsolidation can incorporate new informational elements into the memory such that now the long-term memory is no longer version 1.0, but it's now version 1.1. And this process is iterative, so the next time you retrieve the information, you, it, the information also becomes malleable, becomes uh, susceptible to uh, alteration, and then it becomes uh, uh, available for reconsolidation. Uh, the next slide uh, is a uh, figure that was taken from a recent article uh, by Phelps and Hoffman in which they reviewed the reconsolidation and memory updating research. And uh, in this figure, uh, Phelps and Elizabeth Phelps and uh, Hoffman illustrate uh, periods when a memory is subject to modification. And the uh, greatest uh, susceptibility to modification, of course, occurs during original learning. Uh, memory is extremely labile. 
Now, in the original encoding, that's the uh, figure on the uh, on the left side, the red curve, and that's the original phase of consolidation. But then the memory is reactivated, which all returns the memory to a flexible, malleable state, and then it's subject to reconsolidation. The reconsolidation window period over which the reconsolidation occurs is shorter, smaller than the original consolidation window. Nevertheless, memories can become reconsolidated so that the memory is not really the same as it was the first time if you've had a chance to recall it and talk about it and discuss it. Well, this has huge ramifications for how we talk about our past, right? Um, because it tells us that each time we talk about some past event, the uh, memory becomes open to modification. And if it's open to modification, we can uh, unknowingly incorporate new elements into that account which then get reconsolidated such that the memory becomes updated. And, and with, you can imagine that with successive uh, reactivations, the memory can substantially shift. Now, and as, it, as the memory substantially shifts or changes, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, at some point, you're going to remember something that's just not true, <laughs> right? And so this kind of memory updating can easily result in the creation of false memories. And then the problem <laughs> is to sort out what memories are true and what memories are false. And uh, this is particularly, you know, troublesome. Somebody comes in for therapy who claims to have had a traumatic experience early in life. Uh, what should the therapist do? <laughs> well, the uh, and is this traumatic memory really true? Well, if it's disturbing the client, then you have to deal with the anxiety and, and, and stress that the memory is causing. And whether it's true or not is irrelevant from a clinical standpoint. Of course, whether the memory is true or not can be important from a legal standpoint if... Uh, it's memory of abuse and so on. Uh, but uh, so this is a pretty tricky kind of thing. And, but it occurs not just with uh, uh, personal trauma or uh, things that may involve uh, uh, personal assault and uh, an illegal act by a perpetrator. It affects uh, all of our memories. They've done studies of... Uh, uh, and the memories that people have who experienced uh, the attacks on the World Trade Center in September of 11 of 2001. They've conducted studies in which they, uh, people who were uh, in down, uh, you know, lower Manhattan at the time of the uh, uh, attacks uh, and saw the attacks, saw the uh, first responders coming to the rescue and so forth. Uh, saw the people running uh, away from these buildings, trying to get out of these buildings, saw the buildings collapsing. And so they interviewed these people several times over a, a period of time. And uh, these are in, this is an instance of episodic memory. And interestingly, 40% of the episodic details that these witnesses uh, reported as having been remembered. Uh, for example, a response to the question, how did you hear about the attack? 40% of these details changed over time 
despite the fact that the people making these recollections had very high confidence that their, their memory was perfectly accurate. 40% of the episodic details were altered and 60% of their, uh, uh, the emotional uh, details uh, uh, changed. Uh, so they were uh, questioned about their emotional reaction uh, uh, to the episode. Uh, the emotional reaction was worse for uh, uh, episodic details with 60% of responding changing over time. Although the reasons for the poor memory or for feelings are unclear, the shifting nature of these memories suggest that they may be easier to modify than other aspects of memory expression. So uh, the fact that memories can be modified is now a well-accepted uh, uh, characteristic of memory in the scientific literature. What's striking about this is that the confidence of the individuals reporting um, a detail about their memory, their confidence that they're telling their true story uh, is very high and does not change as the details that they're reporting changes. So current research is uh, trying to figure out uh, what kinds of, uh, under what circumstances, new information is more likely to be incorporated into a permanent memory and issues of that sort. Um, but uh, the bottom line is that you cannot trust the accuracy of people's memory for events that occurred uh, 10, 20 years ago, uh, particularly if uh, this episode has been, uh, the story has been told a number of times in the interim, we can't trust those details unless there is physical proof like documents or uh, newspaper uh, accounts or contemporaneous uh, uh, information that does not change over time. So memories are great and we love having rich memories. And the interesting thing is that many of the rich details of our memories may be of our own creation. So even though we're talking about the past, we are really talking about the present and how we interpret the past given our present circumstance. So memory is not like a history book. It's not like a, uh, an old newspaper or a historical archive. It's a living, growing, changing kind of thing. So I don't know what you're going to remember about this lecture a year or two from now, but it may not match some of the details of what we've been talking about. Anyway, um, I find this uh, absolutely fascinating. At some level, I find it absolutely, totally disturbing. And uh, I don't know how to incorporate it into my own life in which I think about episodes in my own life as being accurate. Maybe they're not. And if they're not, how do I revise the thinking about my life? I don't know. It's really, psychology is a bitch, isn't it? I mean, psychology, the brain just never ceases to fascinate us and sometimes disappoint us. Anyway, I'm sorry to be a, Bring you this bad news, <laughs> but uh, it's part of the contemporary uh, scientific literature on memory. Thanks a lot.